Okay. Uh, now we will discuss uh, some route manipulation as well as NAT. So um, let's explain what happens and how do the RFC 1918 routes and when do they get programmed. So as soon as the controller completes the deployment, so whenever you have spoke gateways and trans gateways, we do not manipulate the VPC routing table at that point in time. We only manipulate it when we program the attachments. As soon as we attach the spoke to the transit, we automatically instantiate the RFC 1918 routes, which are the 10 slash 8, the 172 16 12, and the 192.168 16, pointing to the ENI of the spoke gateway, okay? So again, we do it for obviously for the public subnet, for the private subnets, and to be even more precise for all public and private subnets uh, where the workloads actually reside, okay? So we manipulate all of these to attract traffic to that spoke gateway. And this again only happens when we when this attachment gets configured similarly for this attachment before the attachments come into existence we do not manipulate again we're talking here about when do we manipulate the vpc routing table so just to as a reminder the vpc router is the first top router this is the gateway of the instance so the is the traffic goes from the instance to the vpc router these three routes gets instantiated, the 10, the 172, the 192, they get instantiated whenever this attachment is configured between the spoke and the transit. So these routes get installed within this uh, within the routing table of that VPC router. So the traffic will get sent to the spoke gateway. Okay? So the reason this is important is when you're doing migration, just launching a spoke in a transit does not do anything of its own. Only when you go and uh, only when you go and uh, do the attachments, do the RFC nineteen eighteen routes show up in the routing table of the VPC. Again, we do it for both the public as well as the private subnets. This happens by default. You don't need to do uh, anything for this behavior to actually happen. So the question is, can we also dictate uh, when we inject routes into the airspace? Airspace is the Aviatrix distributed data plane, which basically means all of our gateways, um, whether being spoke or, or transit gateways. So what if you want to manipulate um, this behavior? What if... Um, what if now coming back? So this is this the first point was we discussed here was about when do the routes get injected into the VPC routing table. Now we're discussing a different topic, which is can we customize what gets advertised into the fabric? And let me probably explain. So this arrow basically explains exactly what we're trying to do. So we are trying to customize what the spoke advertises to the transit. Again, it's not really a real advertisement. These are not, uh, there's no routing protocol within the fabric, but it's basically whatever we configure the intent, the uh, controller will automatically go and um, install the relevant routes depending on your intent. So let's look at an example where you have a VPC cider. The original cider was 10.1.1.0, and now you added another cider, which is the 10.1.80.0, okay? By default, this 10.1.80 is not going to be uh, advertised into the transit. But what if you want it to be advertised because you want other workloads to be able to reach um, the workloads that reside in 10180 or the apps and services that reside within that new VPC cider. So you can go and say, I want to customize 
what this spoke is advertising, what ciders, it's customized spoke advertised VPC ciders. You want to customize what this spoke is advertising to the transit. Okay, so there is again a setting. Let me show it to you probably on the um, UI. Just give me a second. So if you go to any spoke gateway and you go to settings and you go to routing, you will find the customized spoke advertised VPC or VNet siders. And obviously you can click on the uh, information and this will take you towards the um, towards um, the uh, documentation. But basically all what we're doing is we are customizing what we what this spoke advertises into the fabric. What's important uh, What's important also to note is that this is, by default, it overrides. Thus, if you wanted to add the 10180, you still have to mention the 10110, else the 10110 will not be advertised, okay? So make sure that, just realize that this is not an additive behavior. This is um, more of a replacement behavior. So make sure whatever ciders you want to advertise are all listed in the customized spoke advertised VPC ciders. Again, so this is affecting the spoke transit route advertisement. So this is affecting what the spoke advertises to the transit. Next, we are looking at the um, customized spoke VPC routing table. So we remember that as part of the initial discussion, we mentioned that whenever you attach a spoke to a transit, we automatically instantiate, we automatically provision the RFC 1918 routes, and we uh, configure the VPC router's routing table to have the 10, the 172, and the 182. What if you don't want all of them. Or what if you have an additional range like the 100.64 that is there in your network? So you want to make sure, because again, this VPC router is the first hop. So if the VPC router does not have a route, let's say you're running 100 in your network and you don't have the route, that packet is going to get dropped at the level of the VPC router without even reaching the spoke gateways. So it's very important that your spoke uh, VPC routing tables are configured correctly. So again, we are basically affecting the spoke VPC routing table, and this is why you see the arrow going into the VPC. So assume that you do not want, you don't have the 10 range in your network. So you, you, I'll go and show it to you on the, it's in the same area. So if you go to a spoke gateway, Instead of customized spoke advertise, you will see customized spoke VPC routing table. And similarly, this behavior is overriding. So make sure you, you list. Uh, in this example, we only listed 172.16 and 192.168. This will automatically override the 10 slash 8 um, from showing in the routing table. So what, just a second. A third setting is um, basically if you want to ignore a route that is, um, basically you want to filter out a route from the routing table of a spoke gateway. So in this case, you have a spoke VPC with 10.1.2, a spoke VPC with 10.1.1. By default, if you're not doing anything, the, the routes from 10.1.2 will actually get propagated on 10.1. What if you want to uh, basically remove it from the spoke uh, as routing table? So what you can actually do is you can use the setting exclude learn ciders to the spoke VPC VNet route table. And this would lead to, again, this is the gateways routing table. And this would lead to 10.1.2.0 
being removed from that spoke gateways routing table. You can think about it like an inbound route filtering um, control so that you only have control on what this um, spoke actually receives. And again, in this setup, we are configuring an exclusion. So we are removing that particular route from the routing table. OK? Again, the setting is on the same page. So you can see exclude learn siders to spoke VPC VNet route table. So um, again, we have many NAT functionalities. Um, very common ones are source NAT, especially single IP NAT, especially if you're going to the internet or you're placing a NAT gateway. Uh, and again, you, there is the other option, which is a bit more complex, which is customized NAT, which is you're doing NAT for a specific interesting traffic and you're not NATing all the, 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 the uh, traffic that goes through. Destination NAT is you're basically concerned about changing the destination IP. Maybe you want to appear to an external entity as a certain IP address, and you do not want to expose your real IP addresses for any reason, um, or you're, you're solving an overlapping address problem. And then there is the map NAT, which is a bit uh, a combination of both source and destination NAT that uh, solves an overlapping address problem in a very simple and intelligent manner. So um, whenever you do a source NAT, and um, basically this means that you want to be the gateway to the internet, if you, especially if you're not doing customized NAT. Customized NAT is um, more policy-oriented NAT, but whenever you're doing enable SNAT here, it means you want to NAT all the traffic. It means you want to be the gateway uh, to the internet, okay? For example, you can replace a NAT gateway uh, leveraging this functionality. So as you see, because you enabled the SNAT um, functionality, the, uh, the routing table of the VPC not only has the 10, 172, 16, and 192, but it also now has the default route pointing to the same gateway. Again, just because you enabled the SNAT functionality. Let me show it to you on Copilot. So if you go to NAT, you can say, I want to do source NAT. And if, if you do the single IP, which is, again, basically means I'm NATing everything, or you want to do customized NAT, customized NAT is where you will have to decide what is the, that particular traffic that you want to NAT. If you don't match that uh, interesting traffic, then there is no NAT uh, uh, functionality that will happen. Okay. This is what customized NAT um, is referring to. So you have a source address, for example, here of 10.1, destination of 10.12. We are going to change the source address to the 192.168.1.0. Similarly, the difference here is that this is a destination NAT. And what we are doing is we are changing the uh, DNAT IPs, which are the 50 range to the, uh, sorry, to the uh, OK, another very interesting um, use case of NAT specifically for overlapping addresses between cloud and on-prem. So here you can see uh, they have a London on-prem site uh, data center connecting to a, a basically a VPC within AWS. And there is a subnet that has exactly the overlapping range. And you you don't want to implement any 
on-prem routing, uh, any on-prem routing functionality, you want to keep it simple. Um, and I mean, may maybe because the router is a legacy router or maybe because you don't have um, sufficient experience on how to handle that. Um, the host information must be preserved. So we are not trying to do a path. We're not going to change all the addresses into a single address because in this way we lose visibility. Okay, so this is the requirement. So we are going to see how MapNet can solve this in a very simple manner. So in MapNet, um, we create virtual subnets. Think about a virtual subnet as a representation of the overlapping addresses. Again, the two overlapping addresses can never communicate. So in order to solve it, we create a subnet that represents that subnet. Uh, which leads that which leads to the fact that we have two new subnets uh, as shown in the diagram. So there is a subnet that is the 172.5.16. This represents the cloud side and uh, or the local side. The reason we say local is we look at everything from the perspective of the spoke gateway. So for the spoke gateway, the virtual local is 172.5.16.0 representing the 10.5.16.0 that is local, again, from the perspective of the spoke gateway. And we, we follow the same logic for the, um, sorry, we follow the same logic for the on-prem side. Again, we have the 10.5.16, which is the overlapping. So we create a, 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 a virtual subnet, which is 192.5.16. This time it's remote because it's remote with respect to that spoke gateway where map NAT functionality is going to be applied. So what the side to cloud gateway is going to do, which is this gateway, it's going to do source and destination NAT between the real and the virtual subnets while preserving the host information in the IP. Um, I'll explain what, what this means in a bit. There is no need to do any on-prem NATing. And the configuration is very simple. You don't need to do, you don't need to have any slash 32 NAT rules. So all what you do need to do from a configuration perspective is to configure these four parameters. Again, local and remote indicate the everything from that um, uh, spoke gateways um, point of view. So for that, uh, for the local, we are talking about this site. It's real subnet is 10.5.16. Real means without any NAT, what was the original IP. And the virtual is the 172.5.16.0. Again, for the remote, very clearly, the real is the problematic overlapping 10.5.16. The virtual is the 192.5.16.0. And now you can see a packet going from that a particular instance, 10.5.25.71. Notice that the packet is not destined to 10.5.20.239 because if the packet were destined to that IP, that packet will never be routed outside the VPC because the VPC believes that it owns all of this range. So in order to solve the problem, we have the packet be sent to the remote virtual subnet. It starts with 192.5. I'm not going to do the subnetting here, but if you do the subnetting, you will realize that 20.239 is the host portion and 10.5 is the uh, network portion. So you will see 192.5 is the network representing the 10.5 and the host portion, which is 20.239, remains unchanged. So this is what we mean by preserving the host information. So this is how the packet gets sent. And it's important to understand this because if you're doing DNS, you will need to map the DNS not to the real IPs, but to the virtual IP addresses. So now that the packet hits this spoke gateway, um, I am doing annotation. Something is not good, one second. Okay, now that the spoke gateway gets the packet, what it's going to do is two things. It's going to do a source NAT and a destination NAT. 
it's going to change the source IP. Again, you cannot come to the server with a 10.5 because if you come with a 10.5, again, the packet will not leave the site. So we will have to change the 25.71 is the host information. So we leave that as is, and we change the 10.5 portion to the 172.5. This way, the packet, this is a source NAT. So we've done a source NAT from the uh, local to the virtual subnet that is representing that um, local site. So this is how we come up with this new um, 172.5.25.71. And the destination IP, obviously we cannot send the packet to the server with a 192.5. Well, now we can change it to the real IP address of the server. Okay, so the in a nutshell, what we're doing is we're doing both source NAT and destination NAT, preserving both the host information of the source and destination all by just configuring these um, four parameters. So there is no change on the on-prem router. The packet goes to the server. And obviously the server sees the packet as coming from the 172.5. So now the server is gonna send the packet from 10.5 to 172.5 because this was the original, uh, this was the source that actually pinged it. So again, no change on on-prem. And we'll do the same thing when the packet goes through the uh, spoke gateway, we will have two things done. We will change the 10.5, uh, the, the uh, server's IP, which is the on-prem, to an IP that is coming from the site. So it will be 192.5.20.239, which is the uh, host information. And we will need to change the destination IP from being the uh, virtual IP representing this server to the 10.5.25.71. Okay. Um, you can obviously for, for routing manipulation actions, I think I've, I've showed you all of where, where, where you can find them and how you can manipulate them for NAT. Um, Similarly, I showed you the source NAT as well as the destination NAT. Uh, again, let me just do it one more time. So for the for going into the NAT, these are the routing options. You have the customized spoke VPC routing table. You have the customized spoke advertised VPC ciders. You have the exclude learn ciders um, to spoke VPC VNet routing table. If you close the routing, you open the NAT, you'll have the source NAT either doing a single IP, which means you are going to, you, this will install the default route um, to, to, to that particular spoke. Or if you want to do it customized NAT, you will have to uh, define exactly the rules on what you want to actually NAT. Uh, similarly, if you do destination NAT, you can enable it. And for destination NAT, you will have to specify exactly um, what is the, um, what is the um, exact rule or policy where you want to apply destination NAT to? Okay, so now we are going to go through lab number five. 